Indicted Fiction, the most untrue crime podcast out there. Everything you're about to hear is fictional, but the feelings you may experience are 100% real. The Case of Adam's Murder, Episode 10, Serial Killer, recorded the night of October 30th. I was on the news, and not for finding my brother's killer. Eating a bowl of cereal and drinking my coffee, the news anchor spoke haunting words. Serial killer appears to have dropped off photos of their crimes at the police station late last night. Serial killer? My eyes flicked up to look at the screen. Me. That's me. Surveillance footage showed me squirming in the drizzling rain, prying photos from my bag, then entering the office and quickly darting out. The anchor continued on that the unknown person is now the biggest suspect in a ring of sudden murders. Sudden? It's only sudden now that it's newsworthy. Tell some of those decayed bodies how sudden their deaths were. With my parents in the back of the apartment and away from the TV, I listened intently. While the suspect dropped off gruesome photos of the crimes, they were not labeled with the location. Police can only work with what's in the background of the pictures and possible fingerprints on the photos. A location? A fucking location! The news quickly switched over to a lighthearted story about the local pet store, so I switched the TV off. After scarfing down my cereal, I ran to my room, scooped up last night's still damp clothing out of my hamper, and stuffed them deep in the back of my closet. Anyone could have shown up in dark leggings and a dark hoodie, but I didn't need any more fingers pointed at me. With a flat front bike tire, a bent rim, and the nerves of a rat in a cat shelter, I realized I'd have to go back to Starbend. I figured a handwritten note or calling in wouldn't be enough. I would have to photograph another body and label it Starbend, all at first. And if the fucking police couldn't figure it out at that point, then I'd go back out, take another photo, and label it with the GPS coordinates. I'd be sure to get the latitude and longitude 100% correct. I dressed quickly, opting for a pair of jeans and a sweater before I decided sweatpants and a sweatshirt would conceal my identity better. I told my parents I was going to Chantel's. I'm still surprised that they haven't asked to meet the carrier of their grandchild. It was only a day ago that they found out about her, but I thought they'd be ecstatic. The only reason I kept it a secret from them was for Chantel's privacy. Maybe they were dealing with the same form of grief I was, knowing Adam would never get to see his child. And I really was going to Chantel's. The only part they didn't know was I was going to bum a ride to Starbend. As I was going to leave, my mother made a strange statement. I really think you should see a doctor, Abigail. A doctor? For me? I looked at her, stunned. The door sat halfway open in my hand. A doctor? She nodded, pulling away from me. Your father and I think it would be best, so... She paused, looking at my father, who was standing in the kitchen. So I scheduled an appointment with the local counselor first. It's... it's for all of us to go. Together. I shook my head. I was... well, I was angry. How dare she think she knows what is best for my mental health? How I grieve is perfectly acceptable. Just because they've decided to hole up in the house and do nothing but dote on the police's every non-existent word doesn't mean that's what works for me. I apologize. It's been quite a frustrating day. I'm just happy to be in bed, staring at the ceiling, and alive. I had waved her off, staving off my fury. I would store it in the place that held the drive to find Adam's killer. She let me leave, but not without a stern look of, you're going to go or else. I really didn't have anyone besides my parents at the current moment. Adam's death signified a break from everyone I thought I could trust, not to mention the loss of him himself. A funny thought made me smirk as I bolted down the stairs. Ah, to live with a prostitute would make for a fantastical writing career. But a doctor, of all things. Not a hug. Not a shoulder to cry on. A fucking doctor. Anyway, I made it to Chantel's on foot without someone approaching me for money. I texted her prior, but she didn't respond. All I could hope for was that she was home. I did have Chuck, though. I could ask him for a ride. But even though he does have a beat-up car, I rarely see him drive it. Plus, a day in the forest with Chuck made me queasy. She answered. I was ecstatic. I gave her a hug once she let me in, and I could just see the baby bump. I refrained from touching it, but dear God, I would give anything to see this baby. Would it have Adam's bright blue eyes, or smile crookedly like him, my father, and I did? I gave her the gift I had picked up on my shift at Supermart. It was cheesy, but I hoped she would like it. It was a mug that said, Best Mom Ever, in glittery pink letters. I thought it matched her apartment well, and she seemed to like it. There were no men present, and she was dressed in comfy clothes. Quite similar to mine, actually. Fiddling with the mug, she blurted out. I quit hooking. My face sort of fell slack as I didn't know what the proper response was. Should I be happy for her? Or sad that she's quit her profession? She continued on, so I didn't have to respond. And I've been sober since I found out. I smiled. I'm proud of you, Chantel. She really does care. 
I found out that I could be comfortable in her presence, in even in her apartment. So comfortable that we ended up crying again. I don't need a doctor. I need comfort. We watched some TV together after crying and ended up eating popcorn even though it was too early in the morning for it. When the third episode was over, I asked her if we could go to Star Bend. She asked why I would want to go there, the remains of our tearful conversation still on her face. I told her about dropping off the photos. She was understanding. I omitted the part about being a potential suspect in the murder and was thankful to find out she hadn't seen the news this morning. What if everyone you knew wasn't human? Linda Bloodworth asks this question in her two books, A Raven's Touch and A Raven's Revenge. The story follows Justice St. Michaels, a teenager who finds out she's not human, and none of her friends are either. She battles being bullied at school and literal demons. When a family death pushes her over the edge, she discovers her true heritage and sets out to chase a demon all the way through hell. Keep up with Linda in her Facebook group, Linda's Blood Letters, and join in on the author events with games, giveaways, and free books. Both A Raven's Touch and A Raven's Revenge are free in Kindle Unlimited on Amazon. Start the story that began the war between heaven and hell. As I stood up to leave with her, she said, Just take my car and bring it back in one piece. I cringed. Chantal, I don't have a driver's license. She looked at me sideways. Girl, she said standing up, how old are you? Just turned 20, I said, feeling my shoulders rise up to my ears. She snatched her keys off the counter and we left. At this time in the morning, it's mostly young families unsuccessfully fishing off the incredibly steep banks that fall into the fast-moving, muddy water. Only two cars sat in the parking lot, so I told Chantel, if I don't come back in 20 minutes, don't call my phone. Just leave. She seemed frightened by the command, but I had not only her life, but now a baby's life to think of. Before I left, I also said, and if I call your phone, don't answer the first time. Wait and listen to the voicemail. I'll say pink glittery mug if I'm in need of help and alone. I will not call if someone is after me. This statement got her eyes wide as saucers. She began to chew her thumbnail as she drove off to park. I raced into the forest, running down the same path I had taken yesterday. I just needed one photo of a body. I twisted and turned and winded down further into the trees until I stumbled across a fresh one. I snapped a photo and turned to leave as my camera printed when I heard something. Someone. Two men were hauling something large behind me. A body. Just out in the open. No body bag. No garbage bags. Just a freshly shredded cadaver. I threw myself behind a bush, hoping they hadn't seen me. I sat there in wet leaves and waited as they approached closer. My heart beat heavy in my chest. Camera in hand, I realized I had an opportunity. Raising the camera's eye to my own, I focused in on the two dumpers. I couldn't see their faces, not yet at least, so I waited and waited. They waddled along, half carrying, half dragging the body between themselves. When I could finally see two faces, I pressed the button. Click. The two looked up, catching sight of me. I gasped, stuffing my camera and the photo into my bag before running. I bolted, straying from the path to follow a sparsely cleared secondary path. No one used it, so trees and bushes had grown smack in the middle of it, but I knew where it led. They followed after, their footsteps thundering behind me. The weight of Adam's pistol sat heavy at my butt crack. It was either them or me. I reached back, snatching the gun from my waistline and charged it. There was a fork in the path, only feet from me. I grinded to a halt, sliding in the leaves and stumbling behind a tree. Firing once, twice, three times, I was shooting blindly as they came from a densely vegetated area. On the fourth shot, I heard a scream. I ran, veering to the right of the fork. Diving around branches and brandishing Adam's pistol, I wondered how far behind me they were. I swerved around trees and launched over bushes in hopes to just get to the road. Soaring over a patch of what I hoped wasn't poison ivy, I landed in an empty field. Plowed dirt lay out for acres ahead of me. I felt like that deer in that movie, never entered the open field. But did I have any other options? Not really. I ran out into the field. The dirt was dry and crunched under my shoes. Any other time and I would have savored each crunch, but hey, it was crunch time. Ha. Huh. So I got diagonally toward the road and I saw her. Chantel was driving alongside the road. The only thing separating us was a stretch of field, a field fence, and a drainage ditch. This woman must be psychic. I ran faster, pumping my arms like it would give me any sort of boost, and as I got closer and she slowed down, I could see her eyes moving up and down, following the gun in my hands. Like a track star, I hurtled over the field fence, then jumped over the drainage ditch. I heard screaming from the forest as I slid around the hood of her car and jumped into the passenger seat. 
Before I could even speak, she floored it, sending me back. We were back at the parking lot in front of her apartment before any words were spoken. Are you okay? Chantel asked. Her eyes had stayed the same size the entire time, and she was panting and shaking in the driver's seat. I looked down at the small bump of her stomach and realized what I was doing to her is wrong. I could make her miscarry my brother's child. I think that would send my parents, Chantel, and me into a spiraling depression that would most likely lead in a triple homicide and a suicide. I didn't realize how much weight this child already bore in this world until that moment. I just hoped she was right, and that it really is Adams. I told her I was okay and looked down, shocked to see the gun still gripped in my hand. I slid it into my waistline as I exited her car. She asked if I would come inside with her. She said it would make her feel better to know I was somewhere safe. So we went inside. I sat down on her couch, wondering how many customers she had had on it. I tried to push that thought away as I checked my phone. Nothing from my parents, surprisingly, but Chuck had messaged five times and called twice. He was desperate to hang out. I texted him back, letting him know I was out of friends. That was sure to surprise him. I think everyone in town knows I have no friends. Well, I didn't. Joel had texted and my stomach sank. I was supposed to be at work, not shooting at his co-workers in the guise of a chilly runner. I didn't answer his, where are you, text. Instead, I was staring out the window as Chantel busied herself in the kitchen. I hoped, well, I still hope that the men didn't get a good look at me. I feel like I'm no longer in the lion's den. I'm in the lion's mouth. Chantel made coffee and when she handed me my mug, she made it a point that I saw she was using the mug I had given her. As she sat down, she said, mine is decaf, by the way, as if I would know what that meant. I assume it's a pregnancy thing? She asked me what happened, so I told her, and I came to the conclusion that how I told the story made me out to be quite the vigilante. I showed her the picture of the men, sure to cover up the dead body with my fingers. When she tried to pry my fingers away, I gave her a look and shook my head. I didn't even tell her about the other photo. In all honesty, this body had frightened me because it resembled Chantel. Young, dark skin, long curls. I was thankful her eyes were closed as I stared through the camera at her. Who was she? A more important question is, will her killer ever feel the maw of justice? We talked about a lot, and she brought up some great points that had slipped by me. Why had Adam been missing for three weeks? This was something that had crossed my mind, but was stored very deep, like under a pile of blankets in my head. We tried to come up with theories. Chantel's made the most sense. If Adam owed a debt, she said it was most likely they would work him until it was paid. Three weeks of working for a drug gang and then a merciless death. I felt sorry for Adam. I felt sorry for all of them. She also questioned how so many bodies were being dumped but not reported by anyone. To counter that, I told her how the news had been lying about low crime rates. I know the police know. At the very least, Detective Bill knows, but I think more cops are on the payroll of this drug gang. I also told her in recent weeks they had put up huge no trespassing signs all over the forested area of Star Bend. She made a statement that gave me chills, almost as if the county has roped that area off as a designated dumping ground for these motherfuckers. Oh, I could believe it. Any more, it was rare I saw anyone in the tree line beyond the asphalt parking lot. Free labor? Free dumping ground? Well, it came at the price of paying off however many officers, but I believe it was about more than money. Money makes people greedy, but power makes people insane. And someone who killed people in such a fashion and dumped their bodies like worthless waste had to be insane. Chantelle asked me what I was doing for Halloween after a period of brief silence. The holiday hadn't crossed my mind, not that it did in past years. Holidays were Adam's thing, especially Halloween. I think his best costume was when we were eight, and he dressed up as Benjamin Franklin. This was a period when my parents still had hoped that he would follow his dreams of becoming a historian. That was truly what the child version of Adam wanted to pursue. I, on the other hand, refused to dress up. I've never been an attention seeker, or really an attention grabber. Adam was meant for the spotlight of everyone close to us. Sometimes the grief still gets in the way of what I know needs to be done. I told her I didn't have any plans, and she looked at me like I was crazy. She had plans to put on a mask and scare the kids who came to her door before giving them their treat. I thought it was nice she had plans and still celebrated the holiday. I'm sure my parents would be hunched on the couch, thinking of past Halloweens. When she got up to use the restroom, I felt it was my time to leave. So as she closed her bathroom door, I called to tell her I had to leave. I said goodbye and quickly left the apartment. It started to feel stuffy and cramped. I had been bouncing my knee so much that I caught Chantel staring at it multiple times. I really just didn't have any more words to say, and the pictures were burning a hole in my bag. I had to get them over to the department. The day was gray and cold, and I wondered how kids would want to run around in this in thick costumes and cardboard. Was candy really worth it? I was nervous. I was so nervous I could feel my core trembling. Would they have security out front? 
or would there be officers in the front office waiting for me? Would I not be fast enough and get snatched up before I could get out the door? All these things were swimming around in my mind, and before I knew it, I was in front of the police department. It was like, bam. People walked by. Cars drove by on the street. I even spotted a few officers chatting it up out front. No one seemed to have an eye on me, so I slipped in. There's a wall of brochures on one side of the room. I acted as if I was glancing through them. Oh yes, I'm definitely interested in this volunteer program. Oh, maybe I could donate some of my time to this organization. By the grace of God, or whatever I as an atheist should be saying, the clerk wasn't at the counter. I whipped out the photos and set them on the counter before taking a last look at them. I forgot the fucking location. I scrambled for a pen, finally finding one under a newspaper on the counter. The clerk's footsteps approached from another room back behind the counter. I scribbled on the white strip of the photo, but the pen wouldn't mark any ink. My heart raced in my chest. What would they do if I got caught? I'm their biggest suspect right now. I threw the pen aside, accidentally tossing it to the ground behind the counter. Digging in my bag, I found a worthy pen. Thank you, Marvin. I scratched Star Bend onto both photos and turned to leave. Oh, how can I help you? The clerk called. She sounded nice, but her voice made my stomach knot up. I raced outside, and as I threw myself out of the building from the open door, I heard her scream. Running. 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 People looked at me strangely as I passed. Well, I assumed that they did. I could see nothing but a blur. I even ran up the stairs of my apartment, only taking a few minutes to calm myself before entering. There they were, sitting on the couch. The room was dark, only a sliver of gray light filtering in from the barely parted curtains. Not a light was on. The TV was black. They were just staring forward. I asked if they were okay, and they answered like nothing was wrong, like I didn't just walk in on them while their minds were in another realm. I wonder if they think of a life where I died instead of Adam. I don't have the gall to ask. So I sat on the couch and turned on the TV. I assume they haven't seen the news, or if they did, it didn't click that their daughter is the biggest suspect in her own brother's murder, and the murder of God knows how many others. Chuck texted over and over and over. I told him I was busy with my parents, and as I was typing, I got a text from Jamal asking if I'd like to come in for a late shift tomorrow. Since I had no other plans, I didn't mind. My parents seem to be lost. I don't understand how they are sitting so idle. The police haven't been in contact with us other than the contact I've made with them. It's heartbreaking to see them so lifeless. Bringing the killer to justice will never bring Adam back, but I'm hoping it'll give me and my family a sense of safety. Thanks for listening. Be sure to tune in next Friday for Adam's Murder, Episode 11, Halloween. Adam's Murder is up for pre-order. Order signed copies on my website, paperbacks on Amazon, and ebooks on Barnes & Noble. If you'd like to read the transcribed audio diary of Abigail Drummer, go to my website, authoralianapo.com slash blog. Each episode is posted on my blog under Indicted Fiction.